Shall I start? Yes. Um, get to start. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say um, that I am so delighted and honored to be part of this festival. Uh, in this, it just filled with vibrant, positive energy, and I cannot believe this spectacular aesthetic. So, um, so happy to be here. Uh, uh, I thought um, what I would do um, uh, is start by just telling you a little bit about my own background and upbringing, um, just so you know where I'm coming from, and also how, uh, a lot of people ask me, <laughs> How did a Yale law professor, who usually writes about globalization and foreign policy, end up being the notorious tiger mother? Um, and I think there are lots of misunderstandings. Uh, several people have said to me, uh, I thought you were going to look like a witch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was born in the United States, but my parents were immigrants. They were Chinese immigrants who arrived in the United States in 1960 to be graduate students. And like many immigrants, my parents worked incredibly hard and were very poor and saved every penny. I remember seeing my father work, stay up till three in the morning every night, working furiously. Um, and I know that he wore the same pair of shoes for eight years. As parents, my uh, mom and dad were typical of immigrants in the United States. They demanded total respect and were very tough with my three younger sisters and me. In fact, the famous list that was published in the Wall Street Journal that got me in so much trouble, you know, no play dates, straight A's, no sleepovers, that list, which I intended to be a little funny or tongue in cheek, that list was applied to me and my sisters straight with no humor. Every day after school, we had to come straight home. We had to do chores. We had to drill math and piano. We were required to speak only Chinese at home. It was a strict rule. For every English word that we accidentally said, we got one whack of the chopsticks on the hand. Uh, our grades had to be perfect. If we got a 99 out of 100, my mom would say, what happened to the one point? Let's work on that. We always had to take the hardest classes. It's funny, I see people now trying to take the easy classes. My mom and dad made us take double the load, always the hardest classes. Um, socially, my parents were really strict. No boyfriends, no sleepovers. And you have to understand the sleepovers. It's part of an immigrant mentality. My parents didn't know anybody in the country. So when I said, mom, can I go to a slumber party? I remember my mom said, but Amy, I don't understand. We, we have a bed here for you. Why do you need to go to someone else's house to sleep? Uh, I don't know if you got, do you have prom, senior prom here? High school prom? Yes? So I'll tell you one story. When I was a senior, I was invited to the prom, but my father said I couldn't go. My mother begged and begged, and finally my father capitulated, agreed that I could go on one condition, that I be back home by 9 p.m., <laughs> which is when everybody else was just going. So I went to the prom, I came back by 9 p.m., and then I snuck out a window. <laughs> but despite all the complaints, my sister and I growing up, we would say, why are there crazy rules? Why are they so strict? But the strategy worked with us, all three of us. Today, I adore my parents. Knock on wood, they're almost 80 years old, but they're still fine. And today, if anything goes wrong, a rejection, something bad, my parents are the first people that I call, the first people. We voluntarily vacation together with my parents. And most importantly, I feel so grateful to them. I, I love my job, I feel I've had opportunities all my life. I've been so lucky, and I really owe it all to them. I, so now I think looking back, although it wasn't always fun growing up, my parents, having had such high expectations for me, not letting me make excuses, that is the greatest gift that anyone has ever given me. And that's why, even though my husband is not Chinese, 
I wanted to try to raise my own two daughters the same way that my parents raised me. Now with my first daughter, it was easy. She was a, just a self-motivated kid. I never had to even be strict with her. But then my second daughter came along. And I know there are many parents out there, you know how different children can be. Completely different personalities. And my second daughter was incredibly difficult. She, I felt like she was born saying no. She, she fought about everything. Even when I was pregnant, she was kicking really hard. And, she, uh, and we're also very similar in personalities. Hot-tempered, um, uh, so I think we always locked horns. I remember one very funny story. We were, uh, she was about six and we were practicing violin. And at one point, Lulu says, stop it, mommy, just stop it. And I said, what? What did I do, Lulu? I didn't say anything. I didn't say a single word. And Lulu said, your brain is annoying me. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. And she was right. I was thinking her elbow was too high, her phrases were not right. Um, so um, most of the book is supposed to be funny, um, but the last third of the book is totally different. And this, I think, a lot of people don't know, because I think the media only looked at the first 10 pages of the book. But when uh, my daughter and I always, you know, we got along great. We always made up, hugged in bed. But when she turned 13, something universal happened. Um, she rebelled, seriously rebelled, and it was not funny. She became incredibly angry and alienated and rude and made huge scenes. And I don't want to give it away, but um, the culminating chapter of the book, it's in Red Square, Moscow. We have a huge fight where I suddenly realize, oh my God, I may lose my daughter. I may just lose her. And when I thought of it that way, I didn't care about grades or violin or I just wanted my daughter. And that's when I pulled back. We made a lot of compromises. We had a big talk. So the, uh, but I held very firm. I mean, it's, it's a working struggle, very high on academic standards still. So the point is that it was the day after that huge fight that I started writing this book. I just went to my computer and the whole thing just poured out. I wrote the Tiger Mom book in three months. The whole thing just poured out. It was like therapy. And I showed every page to my uh, both daughters and, uh, and my husband. So the Tiger Mom book was never intended as a parenting manifesto. Um, it was really just the story of my own journey as a mother, um, trying to hold to my parents' standards, adopt their values, while adjusting to the very different personalities of my two daughters. And in some ways, and this is what I want to talk about, trying to combine the best of East and West. Um, and this is what I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Esther for some questions. I've had a lot of time to think about it, um, and I think that the Asian countries and the Western countries have opposite parenting and education problems, exactly the opposites. Um, and you'll be interested to know that I go to China and Korea all the time. I'm going to Korea next week, and their conferences when they ask me to speak, it's always about exactly the opposite. It's never self-esteem. It's never discipline. It's always how can we have more creativity? How can we get our children to think outside the box? How can we have leaders and initiatives? So I think that China and Korea, they have a lot of problems. Um, and I had those problems growing up too because my parents didn't teach me to question authority. When I went to law school and the professor said, so, Ms. Chua, what do you think of this judge's opinion? I had no opinion. I thought, well, a judge wrote it, it must be good. Uh, and so that is something we change with our own children. We're always telling them to question authority. Just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean it's right. Now, to close, I want to say that I think, what can we learn from the Asian nations? What can we learn from China? They have a lot of problems, so do we. And here's one thing that I think would be great for the Western nations to learn from China. I think it would be great if we could, those, the Asian nations are very good at getting their children to focus, to inst at instilling discipline and a hard work ethic in their children when they're very young. And the ability to focus when you're very young 
is something that will help you through high school, through all your life, especially this day with all these media distractions. I mean, I find it, I always have to check my email. And one thing that my daughter said to me, Sophia, people were saying, how was it raised to be, you know, by this tiger mom? It must have been so stressful in high school. And she said, actually, I think I was less stressed than my friends. And that's because she could sit down and focus for two hours. Maybe because of the piano playing or whatever, but if she had a paper due, she could sit down, write the paper, be done by midnight, and then call her friends and do Facebook. As opposed to what most people do, they have you know iTunes and iPod and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, everything going on at the same time. Suddenly it's midnight, the paper's not done, they're panicking, they need to get their parents to do it for them. So I think a good combination would be a little bit more focus and self-discipline in our children when they're very young, followed by increasing freedom and uh, questioning authority and letting them pursue their own definitions of success as they get older. And that's really what I learned with Lulu. You just have to start letting go. Uh, the last thing I want to say is a lot of people don't understand what the Tiger Mom book is really about. And this is what it has in common with the triple package. In many ways, the Tiger Mom book is a celebration of rebellion. And I bet Esther would be surprised about that. It's a celebration of rebellion. Why? If you read the book, you see that the hero, the protagonist, is my younger daughter, Lulu, the rebel. At the end of the book, I reveal that my father, my idol, my model, that he was a rebel. He was the black sheep in his family. He hated his family. They were too tough, and he left Asia and never looked back. And finally, the entire tone of the Tiger Mom book is rebellious. It is saying, I don't care what everyone else is doing in the West, this is the way that I'm gonna do it. And it's very funny, my mom, who loved the book, she said to me, Amy, no Chinese person would ever have written this book. So um, that's what I wanna end with. I think um, it would be interesting, rather than fighting parenting wars, black and white, my way's better, this way is better. I think we should all try to learn from each other. We know that different cultures have different strengths and weaknesses. We should listen and we should all try to learn from each other. Well, thank you, Amy. That was a very interesting um, interpretation of the book. Um, so, uh, I just thought I would tell you a couple of things that I noticed. On the back cover of the book, it says, your publisher wrote, how to be a tiger mother. So this was not really, looked like your publisher did not know that this was supposed to be just a tongue-in-cheek comic book. Secondly, um, I would say that, you know, if your daughter Lulu was the hero, it didn't happen until the end of the book. And it was after this description that you had in the, China, in the Russian restaurant where she just basically threw the biggest temper tantrum you've, they've probably ever seen in a restaurant in Russia, uh, where she started screaming at you like crazy in front of everybody and then took a glass off the table and threw it to the floor. So that's what it really took for her to be a rebel and to get rid of these punishment techniques that you used as a parent. And so the question that I have actually for you is, you know, you actually also say in the book that, you know, that um, the triple package, which is part of the second book, uh, comes at a price. None of it will make you happy. Triple package does not promise a meaningful life. And then you also say, happiness is not a concept I tend to dwell on. Chinese parenting does not address happiness. So you personally were unhappy as a child. You even said so in the book. And at 13, you were not happy. So why would you want to have this okay. kind of pa parenting perpetuated? You okay, know, so well, a, few, a few clarifications. I had an incredibly happy childhood. I, I loved my childhood. I had so much fun. I just said that sometimes I thought my parents had crazy rules. I adore my parents, and I had... A, incredibly fun. You know, you don't always have to be going around to play dates. You can spend time with your family. There are a lot of different ways of having fun. Secondly, 
Um, it's true. I parented the way that my parents, because it worked on me. And that's a big disagreement. It is something that not just me, but my three sisters are all very proud of. Um, the way we were raised, we're very grateful for it. And that's why I tried to do it with my two children. But what I found is it's very difficult if you're not an immigrant. My parents were poor. I saw their sacrifices. My children were growing up much more privileged. They had friends that got paid for bees. They had friends with parties, incredibly expensive designer clothes. And I just found that I couldn't do the same thing that my parents did because it wasn't as authentic. Now, with Lulu, um, uh, I mean, the book really is about a journey, right? And I think that to, if we're all going to be honest, we have to say that parenting is the hardest, it's the hardest thing I have ever done. I've done so many difficult things. There's nothing harder than parenting. And the best we can do is try to hold true to our values, try to listen to your children and adjust, try to be strong, but always question yourself. Is I'm doing this for the child or for me? What is it? And it's not easy. But there are no easy answers, Esther. If I thought that it was saying, just let your child do whatever you want. Don't do these. Don't yell at them. Don't hold them to these things, and that would automatically guarantee happiness, then I would do it. But it's just not true. There are so many children out there raised by lenient parents, parents who don't pay attention, parents who don't hold their children to high, dis high expectations. In America, we have huge rates of depression and anxiety and substance abuse not coming from strict parenting, but from overly permissive parenting overly indulgent parenting. So wait, University oh, of Texas, um, a professor Su Young Kim did a study over 10 years about Asian American parenting. She discovered that there were more psychological problems in children of Asian American parenting techniques and also they did not achieve at the rate you would expect them to achieve. And also one other thing I wanna say is parenting was really difficult for you because you were constantly on the alert for punishing them. I did not have that same tech. At, I loved it. It was fun for me. Yeah. And so I was not always out there like trying to make sure that they got an A in everything and that they didn't have any sleepovers and that there were no play dates and they couldn't play on computer games. So if, I, if you're not a police person in your house, then you don't end up having yeah. such a hard time parenting. So first of all, I think, um, yeah, I think that you're very, very lucky. And um, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I've seen my husband had very lenient parents. He came out great. I have Yale Law students. They, some had strict parents, some had lenient parents. You can be happy and successful in so many different ways. But I will tell you that there are a lot of parents, uh, children who were raised the way that I was, who are incredibly happy and fulfilled. And I want to tell you about Lulu. Right at the, after this crisis, I wrote the book and they took her on, we, we only allowed them to do one TV show. It was NBC, our biggest station. And they came and they interviewed both daughters and they put them in different rooms. And I thought, oh my God. And they asked Lulu, Lulu, you had so many problems with your mother. Um, you know, what kind of a parent do you think you're going to be when you grow up? And she, I did not know what she was going to say. I was terrified. And she, she looked around, she thought, and she said, you know, I've had some tough moments with my mom, but I think that when I grow up, I am going to be a strict parent like my mom. Because if my mom hadn't done the things that she did, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be who I am today, and I wouldn't like that. And that I'm very proud of. Um, so we are also good friends, like the way that you are. I want to very strongly dispute the studies. In the triple package, we find that that study is completely wrong. There are studies on all sides, as you can imagine. There are many studies that show for sure that Asian students have the lowest self-reported self-esteem. How do you, do you feel great about yourself? They feel they don't say that. However, they, there are many studies that show they have the lowest rates of depression clinical depression and anxiety, maybe because they know how to study and focus. Uh, and also that one more important point, the media has said 
Asian Americans have such highest suicide rates. That is false. Asian Americans have the lowest suicide rates in America of any race group. That is true if you break it out by male and female, and it continues to be true at every single age bracket. At age 15 to 24, for young Asian American women, the gap finally narrows so that Asians have the same suicide rates as the rest of the country. But it's not true, so I do not think at all that it's proven that, uh, that, um, that you know, tough love. Again, I think it's the message. If you send the message, if you don't get good grades, then I don't love you. That's a terrible mom. I totally agree with that. Well, you said that. But I think never. Uh, oh my God. Yes, you said that in your book. Oh, that is you, so false. I wish I could I, quote you directly. I have never, I have, I believe in unconditional love. My message to my children is only one thing. It's I believe in you and I believe in you even more than you believe in yourself. And if you just hold to your standards and don't blame others and don't make excuses, you can do anything you want in your life. No, well, and that is the only message I send. You said don't bring home an A minus. Okay, one, one second because of the timing. Wait, I want Esther, to... please, you, you haven't talked I haven't very had a much. Chance. So you have, yes, I have seen. I know. Please, I will give you three minutes oh, with non interruptions. Instead of, what would you propose as a good education, please? Well, first of all, I just want to respond a little bit to, to Amy about the creativity that they're lacking in Asian countries. Well, one of the reasons they're lacking that creativity is because they're growing up with this regimented parenting. They have no opportunity for creativity because there's certain ways that are right. This is right, and if you don't do it that way, then you're not doing it right. So you can't learn creativity if you don't give students an opportunity or your children an opportunity to play and to have play dates and to do crazy things. And so I think that, that is, that's what's missing. Um, and as far as what would be a, a, good, edu a good way for parenting, I, I pretty much disagree with your entire, um, with everything that you did because I had my students my children, they went on play dates all the time. They slept over at each other at friends' houses. Um, they, I did not want them to watch a lot of TV, but I'd never prohibited the TV. I just bought a 13-inch black and white TV, and so they didn't really like it that much, but they watched it anyway uh, a little bit. Um, I pretty much let them go do a lot of things on their own, ride bikes, go to be in school plays, which you didn't let them do. So this brought out the creativity in all of their activities, which made a huge difference. And, um, and also, I enjoyed it. I had a good time with them. So they come home, they spend a lot of time with me. I see them all the time. I see my grandchildren all the time. And so I think it's a very different way of bringing up children. And I think it's uh, much more creative and works better. <laughs> We need more time, but I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm really sorry. Not enough Thank time. You. Just be, very quickly, I read both of your books, and I see another Amy Chua. I mean, those books, you have change of mind. I mean, it's not what the book says. So that's an evolution. And just one very quickly comment for both of you. You are talking that you're very proud of what you are today because of the education that you have. But there is a crime against logic there. You don't know if probably with another education you will be even more happier, much more successful, and much more creative. So just to explain that what you have had and what you are is exactly the evidence that that was correct is not a good argument. But in addition to that, I just want to tell you that we have here 30 gifted citizens from all around the world that they will receive today an award. And probably we'll ask them not what kind of education they have received, but if we could really have a person and a control group living with both situations to know really what's the point, happiness, success, etc. I want to thank you both of you because you make us think 
very, very seriously about what we are, and at the end, the mode of this festival is don't believe everything you think. Un aplauso, por favor. Les agradecemos muchísimo.